Good afternoon. My name is Kent Mormon, and I'm the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, known as um, Dr. Cog TAC. The Dr. Cog um, meeting does use the digital platform Zoom. Members and alternates um, will have the uh, ability to mute and unmute yourselves and share your webcam. With this new platform, though we are now able to use cameras, I will ask that you still use the raise hand button to indicate you have a question or would like to speak for, for an agenda item, questions or comments. Please make sure that you have typed your name, your type name reflects your uh, first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions related to the agenda items. At this time, uh, Cam will um, list all alternates and members of the TAC committee. If for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added for the record. Cam? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance for TAC members and alternates, I currently see Brooke Svoboda. Brian Weimer, Aaron Busto, Carol Buchanan, Carson Priest, Chris Hudson, Deborah Basket, Eugene Howard, Frank Gray, George Hollenkoff, Jeff Dakenbring, John Cotton, Kent Mormon, Kristen Kenyon, Mac Callison, Ma Melanie Chiquette, Paul Josidis, Phil Greenwald, Rob Zuccaro, Ron Papsdorf, Sarah Grant, Steve Durian. And those are the uh, TAC members I see at this moment, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ken. Um, our freight member, Kelly Heaton, uh, has retired. And I do not believe that Kelly's present today. Um, I would want to publicly recognize him and say thank you uh, for, the, for, the, for his service. Also, Frank Gray is a new uh, business economic and development member. We introduced him last time, but I don't believe he was there. So welcome, Frank, uh, if you're on, online. Again, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll now move open to the meeting to public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined uh, by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing the star nine and we will call on you uh, by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask that you wrap up and your time, uh, your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, after the public comment period, only TAC members and alternates will participate in the discussion regarding each uh, agenda item. At this time, uh, please raise your hand or press star nine if you'd like to uh, make public comment. Not seeing any, uh, we will move on to our next item, which um, is the August 23rd, 2021 TAC meeting summary. Are there any uh, discussions, uh, corrections, or questions about um, that summary? If so, please raise your hand uh, button to indicate you have a question, correction, or would like to speak. Again, I do not see um, hand raised. Um, therefore, we will uh, stand as approved on those items. At this time, we'll move into our action items. The first one is the 2022-2025 TIP policy amendments. And Josh Schwink, uh, Assistant Planner at Dr. Cog, will make the presentation. Josh? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I do have two proposed amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program for tax consideration this afternoon. 
The first is actually um, a number of changes to the Region 1 faster pool related to uh, recent Senate Bill 260 awards. Um, this includes the addition of four new pool projects, uh, adjusted cost, as well as some uh, limits and descriptions on five existing pool projects, and the removal of four completed pool projects from that pool. Um, the total change in cost would be an increase of $8,984,000 to this pool. Secondly, I have an increase of funding on the Region 4 2013 flood related projects pool. This is an increase of $6 million uh, related to additional uh, repair work on SH7. Uh, so happy to take any questions on those. Otherwise, I do have a proposed motion here for you on your screen and in your packets. Thank you, Josh. Are there any questions? Um, Brian, you raised your hand. Go ahead. Uh, Brian, I can't hear you. Um, Deborah, you raised your hand. Brian, I'm sorry, we didn't, couldn't hear you, Brian. Go ahead. Uh, Deborah Basket, City of Westminster. I would move to support the Dr. Cog staff recommendation to approve the proposed amendments. Okay, it's been moved and do I have a second? Brian, do you wanna try again? <laughs> Not hearing you, Brian. Phil, saw that you raised your hand. This is Phil Greenwald from uh, City of Walmart, I second. Okay, it's been moved and second. Is there any additional discussion? And Brian, I'd say you have your hand raised. Maybe you could, if you have a question, you could answer, put it in chat. Uh, he says he has some tech challenges today. So are there any other discussion? Not seen any. Um, it's been moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor, um, please say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. Any abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to our next item, uh, which is uh, another action item. It's the draft regional complete streets toolkit. And Jacob Rieger will uh, start this, and I believe he has the consultant on board to help make this presentation. Jacob, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, everyone. Hopefully everyone can see the presentation. Um, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff uh, with me today for this presentation, as well as our consultant for the Complete Streets Toolkit, Trong Vo. Uh, we'll be doing this presentation together. Just wanna to start off, first of all, by thanking TAC for accommodating uh, the meeting today so that we can work through our public comment uh, and review process for uh, the Complete Streets Toolkit for the draft document. Uh, we had a very robust public comment period as we'll cover in a, in a couple slides. Um, so appreciate the accommodation to get us to this point today where we will be asking for your um, recommended approval of the Complete Streets Toolkit. Um, for just a little bit of quick background, let me turn it over to our consultant, Trung Vo. Trung? Thank you, Jacob, um, and thank you all for, for having us be a part of this meeting. So the Regional Complete, the Regional Complete Streets Toolkit uh, is really intended to accomplish a couple of different goals. And the ultimate goal is to have a complete streets network across the Denver region, right? So the way that we are envisioning getting there is really th through th three different channels. One is to support the 2050 Metro Vision RTP. The second is to provide resources to both uh, local governments and their partners. Um, as well as Dr. Cog. And then number three, to get everyone talking together. Um, on the next slide, we've got a number of supporting goals um, in support of, of the sort of the, those three big umbrellas. Uh, so you'll see um, information on the slide here related to uh, providing a street design typology, um, providing guidance for design elements, which I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about in just a few slides here. Um, 
Uh, and then ultimately this toolkit is going to inform uh, project prioritization. So uh, complete streets will be incentivized um, in that way. So on the next slide, I wanted to, to make sure to point to uh, one of the biggest pieces of the regional street typology. We developed a, uh, to the toolkit, we developed a regional street typology um, consisting of 10 different street types that kind of go beyond traditional functional classification. So this really takes into account more land use um, conditions of the street, uh, not just function in the street network, but, but, but what, what should the street look like? And that is dictating um, or uh, that informs some of the, the guidance around what design treatments are most compatible for each one of these three types. So you'll see on screen here, we've got 10. This actually uh, ended up being about 5,000 miles of, of centerline miles of streets in the Denver region. Um, and every single street was, was classified in one way or another. This doesn't include limited access highways, so free risk expressways um, or local streets. Uh, and then Jacob's going to speak to this online street topology map, and then I'll jump back in after this one. Yeah, thanks, Trung. So as you all remember, the street typologies is one of the most important and biggest pieces of the Complete Streets Toolkit. Uh, we've started with a static map of the street typologies that we all worked on together uh, last year, early this year, and it actually became part of the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. It was actually adopted as part of the 2050 um, RTP. Um, since that time, and given sort of the <clears throat> framework of this being a toolkit, meaning that we want resources and information available to folks actually engage with this information, we've developed in-house Dr. Cog's first story map, and I'm going to click on it, and hopefully it will come up, and you can all see that. I'm just going to very quickly go through this. Uh, we link to it in the memo as well. Um, this is on our regional data catalog. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but I'm just going to quickly scroll through it. Um, but I just want you to know that it's there and that it's a resource. Uh, for local governments, for project sponsors, for interested folks, and anyone, you know, to really sort of engage and understand um, and use these street typologies. So as you get to this point in the story map, um, as you can see, you can actually filter and search through the street typologies, and then they scroll, each one scrolls over on the left, um, so that you can understand kind of what they are, um, how they operate, how they function, and where they are within the region. And then as we get through those, there's a little bit more um, to the story map. And then at the bottom, uh, we link to the toolkit and to some other resources. So while this is not part of the motion to, today, this was sort of a side project that uh, we did at Dr. Cog, it really is meant to be part and parcel of the overall uh, kind of toolkit again of, you know, sort of that data and that information and resources available to help people, you know, engage with and use and help implement uh, complete streets in the Denver region. Um, this is Dr. Cog's first story map. Um, a lot of folks worked on this. I don't have time to thank folks individually, but um, a lot of folks from our transportation planning and operations, regional planning and development, GIS divisions, and our communications and marketing uh, work together to do this. So let me come back to the presentation and turn it back to Trung. Thanks, Jacob. So what does it mean um, for this to be a toolkit? Well, there's really two primary categories of guidance within the toolkit itself. One, chapter two, uh, one of the primary buckets is uh, guidance around these street types. And so those 10 street types that I presented on that, that previous slide, what does it actually mean? What do those look like? And so uh, chapter two includes a, an illustrative graphic as well as modal priorities and then uh, design and element compatibilities uh, for each of the design elements within the regional, regional complete streets toolkit. So a user can uh, look at a street figure out, do that online map or otherwise, um, what the street type, uh, what street type has been assigned to that street. And then from there, use chapter two to figure out um, what, it, what, is, what is Dr. Cog's vision for um, what these complete streets might actually end up looking like. So on the next slide, the second bucket of guidance is really around the tools in the toolkit. And there are seven different categories that include um, curb extensions and transit lanes and street trees and, and um, corner radii, all these different things. So chapter two and chapter three, and really the online map that, that, present, uh, that presents the usual complete, street, street, complete streets typology really are all kind of working in tandem and they're, they're all connected. So there's sort of this process, which the toolkit also describes um, in, in chapter two about how one would go through each of these uh, to put together a, a conceptual or, or full design um, for a street. So at this point, I'll hand it back to Jacob to speak to the public and stakeholder engagement as a part of the development of the toolkit. Yeah, thank you, Trung. So throughout the development of the Complete Streets Toolkit, we had a steering committee 
Um, some of you served on the steering committee. It was really a, a sort of coalition of our uh, local governments throughout the region um, and other stakeholders, other folks sort of interested and involved with Complete Streets um, throughout our, our very diverse region. Um, and so the steering committee met several times as we developed the Complete Streets Toolkit and the Streets Typology. Um, and then as we sort of worked to produce the draft toolkit, um, our steering committee in particular had a pretty long uh, sort of uh, review period first back in July. Um, of the draft toolkit document. And then we had a public comment period from about mid-August through mid-September. Um, as the slide indicates, we received over 100 uh, distinct comments during that sort of public, uh, public comment review period. Um, you know, in, in terms of, I'm always sort of careful characterizing comments that we received in a public comment period. I never want to sort of overgeneralize or mischaracterize comments that we receive, uh, particularly when we get over 100 comments. So we did include the comments matrix um, as an attachment to this item so that you can see yourself exactly the comments that we received um, and both the staff responses to the comments as well as the revisions that we made in the toolkit document. But at the very highest level, I would characterize the comments as uh, supportive of the toolkit. Um, many technical uh, comments and suggestions, particularly from some local government members, um, I think some really thoughtful comments that we tried to um, sort of uh, respond to and address within the revised toolkit. Um, and again, um, if you're interested in any of the particular comments, we've documented those. Um, that is part of our planning process to be transparent and document the comments we receive and the responses and revisions based on those comments. So with that, um, here is the motion that we are looking for today. We are asking TAC to recommend uh, to the Regional Transportation Committee the draft Regional Complete Streets Toolkit document. Um, and in closing, again, I just wanna thank everyone, both all of you at the local government level, um, other stakeholders, you know, who work on complete streets, uh, the staff at Dr. Cog, um, our consultant tool design group, Trung, that you've heard from today. Um, it, you know, it really took a lot of folks to come together to put this together. Uh, so appreciate everyone's involvement with the Complete Streets Toolkit, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob and Trung. Are there any questions for Jacob or Trung? If so, please raise your hand. Alex? Thank you. This is Alex Hedrick with Baltimore County. Um, I don't have a question, but I just wanted to say a big thank you to um, the whole Dr. Cog staff team that worked on the Complete Streets Toolkit. We're really pleased with the process and the outcome. Um, and in particular, the inclusion of rural and mountain roads, which are often either overlooked or not included in these types of documents. So we're really appreciative that um, Dr. Cog made an effort to really include all the types of roadways that we have in the entire metro region in this document. Um, so really appreciate all the work that went into this. Thank you, Alex. Other comments or um, questions for Jacob or Tron? If not, I'd entertain a motion. John Cotton, please go ahead. I'd like to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the draft Regional Complete Streets Toolkit. Thank you, John. Is there a second? Alex? I'd be happy to second the motion. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any additional discussion? Alex, you had your hand raised uh, still. Did you have additional? Sorry, no. no. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, then we will uh, uh, vote. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed Aye. say no. All those opposed say no. Any abstentions? I believe the motion passed unanimously. Thank you. At this time, we'll move into our informational briefings, and the, um, Robert Spots will be uh, leading this on the 2020 annual uh, congestion report. Um, Robert, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. And good afternoon, Tech. Uh, it is that time every year we uh, do review our annual report on traffic congestion in the Denver region. Obviously, the year 2020 was very unique. Um, you know, we're hoping we can at least glean some things from um, what was otherwise a very sad year. And this report's going to get into some of the detail of um, what happened to congestion and to traffic in general during 2020. I'm gonna start by handing it off to um, Melissa Balding on our mobility analytics team, who did a lion's share of the work on the report this year. So Melissa. 
Thanks, Robert. Hi, everyone. As you mentioned, my name is Melissa, um, and I'm excited to share with you what we have um, for 2020 and our annual report on traffic congestion. For our time together today, we're going to focus on several key components of the annual congestion report. Some of them are typical, like traffic volumes and BMT year over year, and looking ahead to a horizon year for congestion. Um, and some of them are not so typical because as we know, 2020 was not a typical year. Um, so we also include how the pandemic has continued to influence traffic volumes into 2021 and how the congestion in 2020 shows us the relationship between traffic volume and travel delay. So to get started, we've shared this graph before. This is showing traffic volumes at a sample location representative of the average across the region over the course of 2020. This is showing daily variation influenced by things like holidays and weather events, but most dramatically this shows what happened in April of 2020 in the pandemic conditions um, with a significant decrease in traffic volume. In the next graph, we kind of go into more details on what's happened at different locations across the region and um, the difference in traffic volume from 2019 to 2020. So we show this as a percent change on the y-axis with kind of a baseline of if there was no change between 2020 and 2019, called out here in red, and then with the gray line showing the average across study stations throughout the region, where we see a dramatic 50% or 40% dip in April, as we can all probably recall, uh, the dramatic shift in travel behavior and travel demand. And then we see on average across the region, a slow return through the spring and into the fall um, to around only 10 to 15% below 2019 volumes. And then again, as we can probably recall, November and December of 2020, bringing back some variation um, and yeah, less travel demand as um, travel restrictions and concern with the pandemic um, increased again. So adding a few specific locations to this graph, we see State Highway 470 northwest of Morrison and State Highway 285 west of Sheraton. We're both kind of close to average. Um, the dots on the map show exactly kind of where throughout the region um, these sample locations were pulled from. Um, and then in contrast, we see US 36, shown here southeast of McCaslin, was below average with a close to 60% drop in April of 2020 as compared to April of 2019. And then a sustained decrease of around 25%, fewer traffic volume at that particular location compared to 2019. We think that this is because of the high office commuter concentration, which is a trip type that sustained that decrease in travel demand throughout 2020. In contrast, I-270 southeast of York Street had a less significant decrease than the average throughout the year and was basically back to 2019 levels, as you can see in the early fall of uh, 2020. And this was due to the types of trips that are predominantly shared on that roadway with more freight and industrial concentration of trip type. And so across the region, we see these varying regional differences in how 2020 traffic volumes um, changed compared to 2019 um, and the trip type and how these roadways are used um, as well as their location in the region um, really did create some of that variance. So it wasn't the same everywhere. It also wasn't the same across the time of day. So as you can see in your presentation packet, there was a variation in traffic volume change by time of day. You can read more about this in the report, but the big story here is that um, PM peak traffic returned more readily than AM peak traffic, and that's a trend that is still ongoing through 2021 with analysis of more recent traffic volumes as well. So to shift to something that's typical of our reports, but atypical in its findings, every year we report on average daily BMT in the region, both as a total number shown in the blue line here and per capita shown with the orange line here. So in 2020, we went from around 84 million total daily BMT 
in 2019 to around 70 million. So on the year on average, around a 15% decrease in BMT. And per capita, we went from around 25 or 26 BMT per capita per day to around 21 or to 22. The per capita number in, includes commercial vehicles and visitors to the region, which kind of add BMT if you were thinking about it on a per person level, but it also includes non-drivers in the region, children, et cetera, which brings uh, the average down. So this VMT per capita number um, of around between 21 and 22 in 2020 sits lower than the Metro Vision target. It's a number we track with Metro Vision wanting um, to kind of be at or below 23 vehicle miles traveled per day on average per capita. Um, and then we also see that for the total VMT number, the daily total in millions, what we saw in 2020 was a significant decrease from 2019, as we mentioned, around a 15% decrease, which brings us back to average total VMT in millions volume that we hadn't seen since around 2005 to 2011. And so that's what you can see. This drop here at the end brings us back to kind of the levels that we were seeing um, around the Great Recession of 2008. So a significant change in 2020. So now we're gonna um, transition to a few observations that came with analyzing this 2020 traffic volume. So first with congestion, just by the numbers, we saw as the previous slide showed about a 15% decrease in vehicle miles traveled. And this resulted in a 35% decrease in some key congestion metrics, those two being um, the total daily vehicle hours of delay um, and the miles of roads congested for three or more hours a day. So 35% fewer roadways in 2020 had congestion that existed for a duration of three hours or more. So in 2019, a little more than 20% of the roadways. Um, if you were to hop on them at some point in the day, you know, your chances of being in congestion conditions um, were fairly high. And then that number really went down um, at a magnitude larger than just the decrease in vehicle miles delay. This is because delay decreases more than VMT, which is a topic we'll explore more later and something that 2020 really provided more insight into that relationship between traffic volumes and delay on the roadways. And then as all of you can probably recall, in mid-April um, and in April generally, we were down around 50% VMT and there was virtually no congestion in the region on the region's roadways. So another observation, dialing in on that uh, 2020 mid-April timeframe, we saw uh, that the types of trips we all took changed, and this was kind of at the peak of how the pandemic impacted travel. So this graph illustrates the trip types that were reduced in April of 2020 as a share of total VMT. Um, so first we see the portion of VMT that is non-office worker commute. So there was around um, half of what would typically be VMT um, non-office worker commutes um, decreased a reduction in that type of trip. And a lot of this was because of people being laid off, being hours reduced, um, impacts of the pandemic. The next type of trip we see is the office worker type of commute. And the reduction in that trip type was even more, more than half, um, as telework was really prominent in the way that office workers could shift and um, how that changed their trip demand and travel demand. Now, typically we see this shopping, social and school, kind of everything else, the gathering with friends for meals and activities, the errands, um, the social trips, typically this accounts for half of VMT in the region. And we see a huge reduction in this type of trips. Again, more than half of these trip types um, were reduced in April of 2020. And so again, this graph is just showing we know about half the trips, half the BMT went away in April 2020. What types of trips were people not taking and what can we um, gather from this? And then the final category of trips in the region is commercial vehicle trips. And there are small commercial vehicle trips and big 
commercial vehicle trips, big heavy duty vehicles. And there were certainly changes, right? With small home personal deliveries increasing. And maybe then there was some categories that stayed the same or increased with grocery stores, et cetera. And then other types of commercial vehicle trips that went away in April, 2020. And think about restaurant deliveries of food supplies and things like that where businesses had to temporarily close their doors. So in this trip category, a lot of changes, but overall net pretty similar. We also wanted to um, show what transit ridership looked like over the course of 2020. So we're familiar with this representation now as a percent decrease from 2019 to 2020. So we see where average traffic volumes dipped about 40% in April, transit ridership decreased nearly 70% and then hovered at around a 65% decrease for the remainder of the year. We know this is because personal health concerns around virus transmission and commute trip changes, specifically that office trip type, those office commuters downtown have been kind of one of the sustained decreases in trip purpose um, reduction as a lot of people are working from home. And previously this accounted for a really large share of transit ridership in the region. Also in gathering our observations of 2020 data, we noticed that despite BMT being down in the region, um, traffic fatalities were sadly nearly the same in the Denver region comparing 2020 to a 2015 to 2019 average, five-year rolling average, um, and actually higher in the state as a whole. So as Dr. Cog continues to partner with agencies to improve traffic safety across the region, the 2020 traffic crash data will continue to play an important role in yeah, understanding how we can reduce traffic fatalities and how there is a relationship with congestion and how um, yeah, we can understand that to improve traffic safety measures. So as we mentioned, 2020 was a non-typical year for traffic congestion because of the pandemic, but we know the pandemic's not over. So we um, wanted to share some 2021 data as well with you all. In 2021, volumes are starting to come back over the course of the year, volumes being traffic volumes on kind of average roadways. Um, and as you can see, the red line popping off the page here is showing 2021, and it's getting close to that 2019 roadway, especially through the spring. Um, and the data we have here is through the end of the summer. Um, and an interesting location to track as it relates to the pandemic over time is Pena Boulevard. So the orange line here is showing Pena traffic volumes, which again, we can see in 2021, the far right of the graph returning to about 2019 levels, especially in June and July, that big jump in 2021. And the other data on this graph is DIA passengers, which we can see tracks really closely with the trends in Pena Boulevard and kind of can draw to memory for all of us what travel demand looks like um, as we've gone through the course of the pandemic. Once again, we looked at variations by time of the day and continued to see 2021 is coming close back to a typical year, um, but AM peak volumes really do remain low. You can see this gap in the 2021 green line with the previously 2019 considered a typical year. So as I introduced, uh, 2020 gives us an opportunity to explore the relationship between traffic volumes and travel delay um, or congestion. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Robert uh, to present on that relationship and our findings, um, as well as introduce uh, a new horizon year of 2050 and comparing that to congestion as we know it. Thanks, Melissa. Uh, so going to do a little bit of kind of nerdy stuff here, if you can click through the animation here. Um, so th this is looking at um, what we call extra travel time. That's one of our Metro Vision measures as we've been talking about this year. And as you can see, you know, in April of 2019, um, during the morning peak, uh, you know, what would normally take you an, a certain amount of time took 65% longer. That was the extra travel time caused by delay. Um, in April of 2020, you know, we're, it's just a marginal increase just caused, frankly, by red lights or the, the crashes or whatever they may have happened. There's just a little bit of extra time sprinkled around the region. Through April and July of 2021, you know, like the previous graph showed, um, volumes are still down. And as a result, congestion is still relative, you know, it's about half of that extra travel time of what it otherwise would have taken in 2019. And next slide or next click. 
Uh, but as you can see, the other time periods are not that way. Um, during the midday in July of 2021, extra travel time actually increased on some of our most congested freeways compared to 2019. And in the afternoon peak or the evening peak um, by July of 2021, that extra travel time was nearing 2019 levels. So, you know, probably it's hard to tell where we're at now with the Delta variant still happening, but we think we may be even closer um, to April 2019. Next slide. So the reason this is happening, uh, again, th this is the concept of volume to capacity ratios. The concept is the more volume there is, the, the less the, the roadway can handle, right? It reaches that capacity, gets beyond that capacity. That's when this curve of delay kind of plummets. It goes down really quickly. So it's stable and then it really plummets down. So in 2019, you know, where we may have had uh, volume to capacity ratio of 1.25, that means the roadway is handling more volume than it can handle by 25% or so. Delay um, would, could have been whatever, say 60, uh, 60 seconds on a roadway segment. In 2020, just taking off that 15% of volume actually decreases the delay by 43%. So all this is to say, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship between volume and delay. And just nipping off that, that extra percent of delay or volume, excuse me, can have a large, much larger effect on um, delay. Obviously good, reduces stop and go traffic, decreases emissions, improves people's quality of life. So, you know, it's a, a real world case study we saw in 2020 of just how taking that 10 to 15% off the top really smooths things out in terms of um, delay. Next slide. So now we're gonna talk about 2050. Um, so 2050, uh, you know, despite the pandemic happening, 2050, this is the first time since we've adopted our MetroVision uh, 2050 plan in April. It's the first time we have done the, the travel model for, for 2050. And so we wanted to bring attention to this still, even though you know, we're, we've moved to horizon years 10, 10 years further out. Now comparisons to 2020 are a little rough because 2020 was very much hope and anomaly that we don't experience anything like that again. Um, so we've chosen to, to do these comparisons to 2019, which was you know, the year before. So you can kind of remember 2019 and your commute and traffic. Uh, back then. And so th these are some uh, infographics about what 2050 could look like um, in our model. I do want to stress that we haven't ignored the um, effects of the pandemic in our travel modeling. We have made changes, including increasing teleworking rates in our model throughout all horizon years into the future. So these numbers reflect those values. Um, Primarily due to population and employment growth, we do anticipate on a regional roadway system about a 40% increase in vehicle miles traveled in 2019 to 2050. That is a huge amount. And so the same way that that delay curve works where if you take 15% off and you get a big reduction in congestion, if you move vehicle miles traveled up on our regional roadway system by 40%, the effects on delay um, in either one of these metrics is much larger magnitude. We are anticipating with kind of this a status quo type of scenario here, a huge increase in uh, delay in 2050. Um, I think we've mentioned this, but one way to think about this is we, th we believe with peak spreading and just the additional traffic during these off peak hours that congestion at 2 p.m. in 2050 will be about as bad as congestion was at 5 p.m. during that worst hour of congestion of the day in 2019. You know, we have to stress, this is just kind of one scenario of the future. Um, we're not going to fix this by building our way out of this. We have to figure out creative ways to avoid and adapt to congestion, whether that's switching the type of trip out of a single occupancy vehicle, uh, we're continuing this work from home trend, or any other um, way we can get ourselves out of this. And obviously, we're all working towards that uh, goal to reduce congestion. Next slide. Um, included in, in the report is uh, our typical map. Again, we chose the in 2050. So in 2019, about 18 percent of the segments in the CMP were congested. Uh, CMP being the congestion management program. And then in 2050, you know, again, a huge, a huge increase and in, in just the amount of links, the, the, the breadth and, and amount of segments that we anticipate to be really congested um, by our mobility score that we calculate in, 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 the, in the system. 
Um, so again, we just have to provide alternate options to kind of avoid as much congestion as possible because it will be widespread and affect, you know, everything from school trips, work trips to deliveries moving in the future. Next slide. So, you know, we've always had questions about the future, obviously, you know, the, the pandemic certainly showed us how things can change in the blink of an eye and affect travel demand and the types of trips we make. We know there's this thing on the horizon with um, autonomous and connected vehicles and safety technology. So we've, we've been kind of always had these ponderances about what's, what's going to happen in the future. We know we're, we don't have the right answers in our models. There's, there's so much uncertainty. But here's, there's a ton of things we're, we're now considering in, in light of this pandemic and, and the changes that were made and what will the new normal be? And, and will some of these changes be sustained? Will, that, will people, the way they do business and get their goods have changed permanently or will this fade away? And we simply don't have the answers yet. Um, we are about to perform one of the nation's first household surveys. Um, you know, we plan to do that starting this year, I believe. We postponed it until travel normalizes, but beginning in 2022 and 2023, that we will be performing a large household survey and kind of reevaluating how people get around in this region. And it'll be an amazing snapshot, which will have a lot of national interest, I'm sure, as we are one of the first travel surveys that's going to happen um, coming out of this pandemic. So I think I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. Are there any um, questions for Robert or Melissa? If so, please raise your hand. Alex, go ahead, lead us off. Thank you. Um, I had uh, two questions. Um, one, a couple slides ago, you mentioned that we're not gonna be able to build our way out of congestion. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little more on what exactly that means for the region's transportation investments. And then my second question is, um, CDOT is poised to adopt a greenhouse gas reduction rulemaking um, for transportation planning. And my understanding is that um, this is going to lead to an estimate, if adopted as currently proposed, would lead to an estimated 11% reduction in BMT. And so I recognize that this rule is not in place in time for this report, but wondering um, for the 2021 report, how is that going to impact the 2050 projections for future congestion? Thanks, Alex. Both good questions. Um, so the first one, you know, I, by saying we're not going to build our way out of this, you know, there's there's literally not enough space for us to um, anticipate having the same level of congestion today as we do in 2050. We're simply, you know, we're growing by about a million people and 600,000 jobs. We anticipate that means there will be um, just a, Far more people wanting to use the roadway system as it exists, right? So that's going to require us to, uh, to and require households to make individual decisions on how they want to cope with that. The fact that the roads are that much busier, will we choose to, you know, find employment opportunities that allow us to telework? Will we get more deliveries so we don't have to drive? Will there be, you know, changes in technology that allow the, the roadways to operate more smoothly. So, you know, it's just going to take creative, creative solutions. Again, we, there's no way to just keep on adding lanes and, and cope with that amount of congestion. To your second question, you know, there's, there's a lot in flux, as you know, with the greenhouse gas rule, we're working closely with CDOT in partnership with them um, on how our plans will change, how, how, some, how we're gonna deal with some of those things in the model in terms of, aside from, the, the network as it exists, what can we anticipate in the future in terms of changes to land use, changes to, um, again, teleworking, working from home. So different way, you know, we're, we're looking at improving bicycle and pedestrian network networks to again, shift modes out of single occupancy vehicles. Um, we're not sure we, don't, sure we have the answer to that yet, but it's, we're working through that technical process with CNET right now. Thank you. John, go ahead. Can you explain why the uh, deaths stayed basically the same, even though the, the traffic significantly reduced? It's a really challenging and, and sad question, John. We, um, we're just getting initial data right now. We have not had an opportunity to receive all of the 2020 data in terms of the number of crashes, the types of crashes. Um, initial speculation um, from CDOT and others has 
then potentially that there was an increase in speeding because the roadways were emptier. But as Melissa mentioned, we are keenly interested in why this occurred and hoping that it can provide some insight into our future um, Region Vision Zero efforts. Yeah, Robert and uh, John, I just, this is Jacob, I would just add to that. We don't have the empirical evidence yet, but I think we've all seen kind of those articles and it was a trend here and around the country that, you know, with the significant decrease of traffic during the height of the pandemic, those who were driving, some folks, unfortunately, took license to drive, you know, 80, 100 miles an hour on the freeway, right? Really sort of aggressive, dangerous driving um, that led to um, crashes and fatalities. So again, not the empirical evidence is that alone explain it. Um, but that was a trend that was observed at least casually both here and around the country. And it's something that we're digging into. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other uh, questions or comments for Josh or, Josh or Melissa? Not seeing any hands raised. Thank you, uh, Robert and uh, Melissa. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, and uh, we'll move on to our next item. Our next item, uh, item seven, continues our discussions on the 2024-2027 TIP policy that we'll be uh, recommending to the board in the future. And uh, Todd, uh, I'll let you lead our discussion, uh, continuing discussion on this. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Um, so we are going to dive into some additional topics. Um, and on the docket for today is a continued discussion um, regarding tip set-asides from August. Um, the next two are some discussions that we'd like to have with you um, regarding growth and development and the connections they have to transportation, and then also air quality and GHG integration into our tip application. Uh, and the fourth is a, a little bit of a meteor topic today uh, and how to integrate um, the new multimodal options fund and how that kind of aligns with um, not only the current programming for the TIP, but also for uh, the next four years. Uh, of course, as we have done in the past, um, we are using menti.com to gather your, um, your thoughts and initial, um, initial thoughts on the topics that we discussed. So, uh, you can go to menti.com and enter the code you see on the screen there, um, or you can use your smartphone and you can scan the QR code. I will leave that up just for a second here so everyone gets that. All right, so now we can dive in here to the tip set asides. Um, so again, this is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is a continued discussion from August. Um, and see so what you see on the screen here are the existing TIP set-asides from the adopted 20 to 23 TIP. Um, we will revisit this here at the end of this part. Um, so uh, don't feel like you need to memorize what's on the screen here. Uh, so just wanted to just give a high-level overview. Uh, I'm not gonna touch on everything that's on the next uh, few slides, but, um, just gives a general overview of the proposal going into the 24 to 27 tip. Um, so looking at the CMPI set aside, um, the recommendation is to remove that set aside. Um, the actual elimination would be contained to the small infrastructure grants. Uh, however, those would still be eligible under uh, both the regional and sub-regional calls. Um, the proposal is to remove um, However, refine the studies portion under this set aside into a new set aside, which we are calling the community mobility planning and innovation. Um, so a, a close name to that, but is, is truly is a new set aside. And again, we'll explain that here um, in a slide or two. Uh, the next is for the uh, TDM set aside, where the proposal is to increase um, by just over $2 million. Um, the set aside includes uh, funding and programming for the Way to Go program, uh, for TDM, uh, TMA partnerships, and for a non infrastructure project call. There's actually two of them um, in which we would be able to fund over those four years. Um, the next set aside is the RTO and T, or Regional Transportation Operations and Technology. Uh, staff is proposing no funding changes for this set aside. 
Uh, so approximately three quarters of the funding available, uh, roughly 14 to $15 million would go towards a call that would take place during that cycle. For the air quality improvement set aside, uh, this is funding that would be allocated directly to uh, the Regional Air Quality Council um, for four main programs. Um, the first is their ozone outreach. Um, the second is a new program that um, kind of, it's more community-based in terms of marketing for ozone. And again, this further provides further awareness on a localized level. Um, the third is a, a combination of different programs um, with the goal to reduce emissions. Uh, and finally, there's funding for ozone modeling. Uh, the next proposed set aside is the continuation of the human service transportation, um, where staff is requesting, uh, looking for a $4 million increase. Um, the, the one uh, good thing about this set aside, obviously providing um, that service and mobility for the vulnerable population, um, but it, the funding provided in this set aside is coordinated with other transit funding. Um, it is pooled together to provide more resources and some match support um, for those communities or organizations looking to utilize that funding. Uh, and finally, the new uh, set aside that I mentioned earlier, um, community mobility planning and innovation uh, has three main components. Uh, the first being transportation corridor planning. And again, this is a continuation of work that Dr. Cog staff will start um, this year that's contained in, within our unified planning work program. Um, the second is the shift from the other CMPI program, which is the community mobility planning, um, which focuses in on um, calls for projects for regional plans, studies, and non-infrastructure um, land use, transportation activities. Uh, and finally, the third component is for innovative mobility. So we have put that together as requested at your August meeting into one table. Um, on the far left, you see what the set aside program is. Uh, in the second column is the 20 to 23 tip, um, followed by the proposal for the 24 to 27 tip. Uh, then again, the far right hand side of your screen, you'll see the net changes in Dr. Cog allocations. Um, total change approximately a $14 million increase or approximately 28%. Uh, this is right in line with what we believe the Dr. Cog allocation increase would be um, pending a new transportation bill. So I will ask the question on menti.com um, if you could uh, enter your answer. Basically, do you agree or disagree with the staff recommendation for the TIP set aside proposal? And I will mention that uh, beginning at your TAC meeting later this month, at your regular scheduled October TAC meeting, um, this will be included as part of the overall draft TIP policy that we'll begin to discuss um, at that time. All right, give it another 10, 15 seconds here, unless somebody tells me otherwise. All right, well, we will move on to our second topic. All right, so the second topic, uh, again, along with the third, as I mentioned earlier, concentrates in on the TIP application and so we're looking at um, Todd. Before we move oh, on, it looks like yep. Deborah had a had a question or comment. Yes, can, Deborah. Can, uh, could you check? Uh, I noticed there's a hand raised on the attendee. It was. I, I don't know if that person's supposed to be on our side or not. So. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. That's Mr. Uh, Frank Bruno. Uh, for some reason, he can't get promoted to panelist. But yes, he also has a question. Okay. Go ahead, Deborah. Thank you. So, Todd, I, I wasn't sure if you were going to go through everything before we had discussion, but before we lose it, I, I just want to make a comment on this. I was really glad to see the percentage of people that supported it in this initial poll. 
I had a chance, sorry about that. I had a chance to obviously review the presentation in advance and I am really excited about this shifting of funds. I think it is reflective of Metro Vision. And I will say the thing that I'm most excited about is the shift in funding, increase in funding for human service transportation. Um, this morning I heard our state demographer speak and it just continues what we've all better know about our aging population. So this is a way to help improve transit. I'm sorry to be pedantic about it, but we keep talking about RTD at this time is unable to meet the needs. If there is a way for other providers to support these particular needs, it, it helps to balance the overall um, transit mobility equation. So thanks, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Frank answered in uh, the uh, chat, I believe. So I think we're okay there. Um, Todd, go ahead with your presentation. Okay. Uh, All right. Um, as I was uh, saying, the, the TIP application has always had questions that sort of dealt with land use, growth and development, and how that connects to the transportation projects um, being proposed. Um, you know, it, it contributes to these outcomes and objectives that have been established by the Dr. Bo Dr. Cog board, whether through MetroVision or, uh, you know, any adopted recent um, regional transportation plan. Um, so the ways that Dr. Cog staff has looked at it before through the applications um, include the items that are listed on your screen here. So we've looked at um, how those um, projects support achieving, you know, affordable housing, sustainable development patterns, um, how do projects improve access to and connectivity between designated urban centers, mixed use areas, um, transit oriented development, station areas, or you know, any locally defined priority growth areas. Um, we've also looked at the location of a project and, you know, is a project in um, a, a zoning area or I say an area with zoning that supports compact I guess that's mixed use development patterns and a variety of housing options. Uh, we've also looked at um, how a project would improve access to opportunity, whether that be through and connections to t uh, key employment centers or regional destinations, um, health services, commercial, educational, cultural, recreational areas and opportunities. So again, these are just some of the ways that Dr. Cog staff has introduced these topics and tried to make those connections um, with land use, with growth and development, um, with transportation. Um, but we certainly are, are asking this question today to really to reach out to get your thoughts and suggestions on how we be, might be able to, um, you know, work again through the TIP application to really make these important connections. Um, Alex, I see you have your hand raised. Let you go first. Thank you. My uh, question or comment was actually on the last slide um, about the set uh, the set aside pools. Um, I was one of the few that voted uh, disagree, and I guess I wanted to address the the reason for that. Um, I agreed with almost all of the recommendations um, for the uh, the tip set asides, um, but was a little hung up on one area, and so I, I voted disagree. And the, the one area that I have a concern is the elimination of the infrastructure side of the CMPI pool. Um, and the reason for that is I think there's some excellent projects that came forward in that pool uh, the last time that it opened that are perhaps even too small for the sub-regional TIP process. And it's not clear to me exactly where those projects um, would be able to compete well uh, in the future set of sides proposed. So I'd, I agree with probably 90% of what's on this slide, but just a little concerned that we're losing um, an infrastructure pool that was particularly well suited to some of the smallest projects that we've awarded funding to. Todd, do you want to address that, Amy? Um, I, I can say something basic, but certainly if, if I don't know if Brad's on um, this meeting and, and he can maybe speak specifically to it, but in, in general, um, smaller, trans, smaller infrastructure projects um, are are fairly difficult to manage, not only from the local government perspective, but also from CDOT. Um, so that certainly was one of the, um, the key reasons why. Um, and again, I don't know if, if Brad, you happen to be on here, um, where perhaps you can chime in again, because you work directly with this set aside. 
Hey, Todd, I'm, yep, I'm here. Hi, okay. everybody. I'm Brad Calvert, uh, Director of Regional Planning and Development. Uh, we work with, with uh, Todd and TPO on uh, the set aside, uh, and Todd's speaking to at least sort of one of, of uh, the primary issues with the small infrastructure is the, the federal, federalization of those projects um, and sort of the, the, the amount of work that ultimately comes with uh, maybe implementing those, those smaller projects, but also through the set aside, um, we have found that the there is more demand on the planning side. Uh, we're sort of oversubscribed in terms of requests. Uh, for the planning support uh, side of that set aside. So for instance, in the most recent uh, set aside, which I think you all took action on either last month or the month before, uh, ultimately we funded all the small infrastructure projects and ultimately left um, some planning projects, some planning and studies uh, unfunded. Um, so really kind of comes down to that sort of those two things, a lot of interest um, to for additional uh, support on the planning and study side and just the realities of, of ultimately federalizing um, small infrastructure projects. With that, we also know there's a lot of interest in the small infrastructure side of things. So I, I, I tend to think of us as continued to be committed to understanding how and in what way uh, those projects can find their way um, into these conversations, um, but, have, and, and, but at this point are recommending that they um, are removed from the set aside as proposed. Thanks, Todd, for the opportunity. Thank you, Brad. Uh, thank, you. thank you for the context. Um, Ron, did you have something you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I just I just wanted to build on that, and I appreciate um, Brad's comments greatly. I, and Alex, I, I think I don't I don't think you are the only person or only jurisdiction that sort of has shares some of that concern. And and I want to assure you, we want we want to work with folks to identify. Um, really good projects for those that that could be competitive in the sub-regional forum context and you know maybe instead of doing one small project there's an opportunity to sort of put together a package of improvements that can make a really significant difference in a, in a local jurisdiction um, to support metro vision and our transportation objectives so um, you have you have my commitment and I, and I think I think that's shared by all the Dr. Cog um, staff that are involved to to really be willing to work with local jurisdictions to to find different ways to address to address those needs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, George, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just have a comment on the last slide that was presented uh, with a question. Yeah. So I would just like to add to these um, considerations the access to multimodal transportation hubs, including airport, right? Okay. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, George. We, we kind of danced that, I think, Todd, in some of these, that, that might be a, a good one to, to add, uh, let the rest of the attack uh, weigh in a little on that if, if they disagree or, or agree. And I do not see any additional hands raised. George, I assume you just haven't taken your hand down yet. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. No problem. Okay. Well, and, and that certainly, as I mentioned earlier, um, we anticipate bringing the entire an entire draft of the TIP policy to TAC uh, later th this month. Um, so certainly if we uh, do have additional discussions or questions and there's some you know, concepts of how growth and development could be integrated into the TIP application, uh, we could certainly take those at any time over the next couple months. All right, so we can move on to part three, which is very similar um, to what we just discussed. We're looking for feedback on how air quality and greenhouse gas um, might be integrated into the TIP application. Um, just like land use, growth and development, um, air pollution reduction has always been part of um, proposed TIP project applications. Obviously, this is even more important uh, for this cycle as we get into the greenhouse gas rulemaking and everything that's involved with that. Um, so just uh, we threw some examples on the screen uh, on, on considerations that might trigger some discussions, you know, does the project reduce traffic questions or reduce traffic congestion and what types of questions could be asked uh, in relationship to that? 
Um, does the project reduce vehicle miles traveled or VMT? Does the project um, reduce um, SOV travel? Um, does the project implement strategies from the re uh, regional complete streets toolkit? So again, these are just some initial conversations, hopefully uh, thoughts to get the conversations rolling. Uh, and we certainly would be interested in hearing from any feedback that you may have. Alex, go ahead and proceed. Thank you. Um, I guess I am having a tough time wrapping my head around how any project that expands roadway capacity could possibly improve our air quality or reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so I was hoping somebody could speak a little more to that because from my perspective, if the project increases capacity at all, you should get a zero in your air quality or greenhouse gas reduction score. Alex, this is uh, Kent. Um, I'll give you a good example. Um, increasing some capacity on I-25 while it may draw traffic to I-25 would be better than running on Washington and Huron that run side of it and with all the signals because they might run at a better flow as, as an example. Uh, or on 270 where we have uh, freight movement and um, getting in and out or they're congested, they're still got to get in and out of that location. So the demand is there. As an example, it wouldn't be induced demand necessarily. I, I guess I just I have to disagree with that characterization. I don't understand how it couldn't be induced demand um, because any travel that shifts from those local streets to the interstates, then there's going to be more capacity essentially left over on the local streets and then more trips will occur there. And I think we've seen that with pretty much any capacity project um, that has taken place around the country and within the region, um, that if you build it, they will drive. Um, and so any short-term gains in operational efficiency are quickly um, undone in the long-term by more trips um, and trips converging. And then we just get back to the same level of congestion on a wider roadway than we had before. Yeah, I, I guess I disagree with you on that, um, especially if we're not widening the other roadways on there so and yes traffic does grow as population grows um and i don't disagree that we do need a, a robust transit and network and other active transportation networks also on there so but that was just a couple of examples hmm. so uh any other uh folks want to weigh in on this I, I'm not disagreeing with, with what you're showing here, Todd, by the way, just um, um, as we move forward. Okay. Um, well, as I mentioned with uh, the last item, um, again, we'll be bringing this item certainly back through um, for additional TAC discussion. So this is not the end of that uh, discussion for whether it be um, growth and development or air quality, um, but we will certainly sort of use what we see on the screen here as a starting block and sort of take it from there and provide additional context um, at a point later where you can certainly add, add and, and uh, certainly look over and make comments. Uh, Brian made a uh, comment in the uh, chat that the VMT does not necessarily directly affect GHG. It depends on the location of the project and uh, John Cotton also agreed uh, with Brian on that. So uh, just a couple more comments in there in the chat. Uh, Todd, you may want to look at. Okay, certainly. All right, um, we will move on. So the next topic is a little robust, if I, <laughs> I must say. It is a little bit complex. Um, ultimately, um, staff is going to be providing a couple options to move forward. Um, um, I would certainly invite our staff if there's something that I missed or that adds and you know provides additional context, please uh, feel free to speak. Um, but we'll try to get through this and hopefully by the end of this, everyone has made a little bit of sense out of this and it provides a, a decent path in moving forward. Um, so as you recall, with the 20 to 23 call approximately four years ago as part of Senate Bill 18, Senate Bill 1, um, there was a new funding source um, introduced as Multimodal Options Fund. 
um, with a goal of further developing a complete and integrated multimodal transportation system. system. Uh, eligibility um, included bike and ped, transit, multimodal uh, mobility, and studies. So Dr. Cog received 60% of the statewide total, which was just under $46 million. Um, this did require a 50% match um, with the funds expiring in June of 23, so coming up fairly shortly. Um, recently this year, uh, as part of Senate Bill 260, um, this program was renewed and renamed. Um, it was renamed as Multimodal Transportation and Mitigation Options Fund. Um, the acronym remained MMOF, or Multimodal Options Funds for short. Um, just had a couple of additional um, titles thrown in the name. Uh, the eligibility was expanded to include modeling and I will say greenhouse gas mitigation projects that decrease VMT or increase multimodal travel. Um, that language is taken directly from Senate Bill 260. Um, at this time, um, since the CDOT Transportation Commission has not met and further provided any context to that eligibility, um, we are sort of in the dark exactly like anyone else would be. Um, so we don't know exactly what that means in terms of further eligibility and what sorts of project types would fit into that eligibility definition. Um, the amount of funds that would be coming to Dr. Coggett's distribution is unknown at this time. Um, however, um, based on everything that we are aware of and based on the previous formula that was used, uh, we estimate there would be $167 million coming to Dr. Cog um, over federal or fiscal year 22 through 27. Uh, and again, the CDOT Transportation Commission is expected um, to take this item up um, as a topic in November. So at that time, hopefully we would know a little bit more about the eligibility and also about the distribution formula, which would um, further allocate the funding to Dr. Cog. Um, so the state did something a little bit interesting with this funding source. Um, it also used the Federal American Rescue Plan Act or the ARPA funds um, along with the Multimodal Options Fund. And what it did is it, it um, put those funds into FY22, um, heavily front-loading that into the overall schedule for, um, for the estimated uh, allocations. Um, the ARPA funds have an obligation deadline of the end of 2024, and those funds must be um, expenditured by the end of um, 2026. And it's only the ARPA funds that carry those deadlines. So that means only the funds that are distributed and used in FY22 carry that um, those deadlines. The remaining funds, 22 through 27, and actually beyond that, do not have those deadlines. So as Dr. Cog's staff was sort of unpacking all of this information, um, we started to think about, well, how does how might this work? And what are some of the issues that we're, we're kind of seeing? So again, this screen kind of outlines that. The, the first being um, that the Multimodal Options Fund requires a 50% match. Um, and the eligibility for this project type is somewhat limited. Um, recalling back four years ago when the multimodal funds were part of um, the entire Dr. Cog process, it was fairly difficult to be able to get applications that were willing to support a 50% match. Um, so we certainly are aware that it is going to be a challenge um, on top of having this program have a limited flexibility um, within it. Um, the second issue surrounds um, how the TIP is constructed and that these funds are actually available now for 22 and 23. So following a normal TIP policy process, um, we certainly will go to our waiting list first, um, but we also know that because these are multiple options funds that are gonna be in 22 and 23, it's the funding type is not gonna necessarily line up to the waiting list projects that we have. And it's gonna provide some problems. Um, again, noting that there is a 50% match requirement and 
the multimodal options fund having limited um, limited eligibility. So we also looked into the possibility, well, could we provide some, some funding swaps with the FY22 and 23 multimodal funds with existing projects? Uh, we did look into this and it will be possible perhaps for some projects, but that will not eliminate um, the larger concern that there is a, a larger amount of funds that exist out here that we will need to program for 22 and 23. We also looked into the possibility, well, what happens if we just hold a brand new call for projects using the 22 through 25 multimodal options fund? Um, the only issue with this is that it would kind of butt up and be actually at the same time as the anticipated regional call for projects for the 24 to 27 tip, 27 tip cycle, both which we anticipate um, would happen um, as early as January. Um, we certainly as staff would not want to advise going through a um, two exact call for projects at the same time over two different tip cycles. Um, another issue identified is that um, how the tip is constructed. So Dr. Cog adopts a tip every two years um, and we construct a uh, we hold a call for projects every four years. So that means within our current 22 to 25 tip, um, there are, with a couple of exceptions, there are no Dr. Cog funds programmed in 24 and 25. So the question that needs to be asked is, well, should we just hold the 22 and 23 funds, not program them now, and simply wait a year or so until um, we push those funds off into the 24 to 27 cycle. Um, another big question is, well, there's uncertainty with um, a replacement for the FAST stack. Um, is it going to happen? When is it going to happen? Um, there is all, there has already been a second continuing resolution for the FAST stack, which extends it out until um, de uh, early December. Um, there is... Um, discussions in Congress that they have a self-imposed deadline of the end of October for a new bill. Um, again, we don't know if that is if they're going to meet that deadline or that will be extended. At some point in time, um, we're there's going to have to be a fast act uh, replacement. Um, you know, the the fact that having continuous CRs is just not going to be practical. Um, so. If there is a new bill, the assumption is that we would get additional or a higher higher level of 22 and 23 funds um, beyond the multimodal funds that are now being identified. What will those funding levels be for that next tip cycle in 24 to 27? Um, a draft bill has been released, um, so we can make some estimates, but at this point in time, we simply don't know um, what the answer is. There's just too many uncertainties. So we sort of worked through this and tried to keep a couple things in mind. Well, let's develop a couple options that really have two goals in mind. One is we know there's those ARPA spending timelines with the FY22 funds. In addition to that, try to you know, maximize the leverage that we can have um, knowing that the multimodal options fund carry that 50% match. Could we perhaps combine that source of funding with other federal sources of funding and work to reduce that 50% match down to a standard 20%. Um, so the next slide, couple slides go through those options. But first we wanted to go through a, a couple of key things, regardless of which option we sort of work with going into the future. Um, the first being is that, um, Per tip policy, we will go through the wait list process first, um, regardless if it's just the multimodal options fund, regardless if a new bill is passed or not. Uh, we will work through that as much as we can um, with the knowledge that we have at that time um, and, and sort of go from there. The second is um, the staff is looking at conducting any future calls we have simply using two different tracks. So the first would be um, using the Surface Transportation Block Grant or STBG funding source. 
So there would be one application um, that would solely be used for those funds and all of the eligible, eligible projects that are under that funding source. Uh, it would continue to use a 20% match. The second tract would uh, be a tract that we would call the air quality and multimodal tract. Um, this would use the multimodal options fund, um, CMAC funding, um, TA or transportation alternatives funding. Um, and if a new bill passes, um, what uh, is now called the CRP program or the carbon reduction program, uh, we anticipate that we'll follow similar rules and regulations as CMAC, uh, though we will know more in the future if that bill becomes uh, becomes law. Um, and of course, it would this this track for air quality and multimodal would use um, those funding sources and the eligible projects that are under that. Um, we would continue to require the 20% local match on the federal sources. But this gives us the ability to combine the different sources of funding so that we could use the federal sources of funding and the local match to match the multimodal options fund. And we could use the local funds that are contributed towards individual project to match the federal sources of funding. So another way to look at it is we're, we're trying to reduce, combine the different funds to really reduce that down to a, a normalized 20% match for both of these tracks. So the first option um, is what we're calling sequential. Uh, essentially what this is, is that um, the first two call for projects um, would be the regional and the sub-regional call for the 22 to 25 tip, the current tip, using only the air quality multimodal track. Um, once that is complete, we well, first of all, I will say we'll expect to start that here in January. Uh, we be able to finish that up by um, this coming or about a year from now in September of 22. Um, as soon as the board takes action on those projects, we would be able to amend those projects directly into uh, the current 22 to 25 tip. Directly following um, the board action to approve those projects and amend those into the current tip, uh, we would issue a call for projects um, back to back regional and sub regional for the next tip 24 to 27 uh, that those two last calls would simply be for both tracks using the STBG track and the air quality multimodal track. Um, the timeline on that um, again following October uh, starting in October of next year, uh, we'd be able to finish up the sub regional process. Um, by the by July or the summer of 2023 um, and then adopt the 24 to 27 tip. Um, the next option that we sort of thought was, was a, what about a parallel track? And this simply would conduct one regional and one sub-regional call that would cover all the years between FY 22 and 27. And 27. Um, we would be able to take the projects um, that are programmed in 22 to 25, we could simply amend that right into the current tip and all those remaining projects that are programmed in 24 to 27, those would move into um, the draft 24 to 27 doc document and then we could adopt those. Um, timeline is slightly different. Um, again, we would be able to Actually, the timeline is very similar to what we're thinking about now, excuse me. Um, we would be able to open this call um, in January, um, hold the regional and sub-regional calls back to back. By the time we get to, to December of 2022, we'd be able to place those projects from 22 to 25 in the current tip. Um, and then a few months later, work on adopting um, by April or May of 2023, adopt the 24 to 27 tip. Um, this option would allow us to do both of those tracks, so both the air quality and multimodal track and application, and also the STBG track. Um, sort of summarizing the discussion on option A, um, this will allow us to allocate those current multimodal funds a, a slightly quicker, um, say October versus December of 2022. Um, 
this will also allow us to you know, work out additional details if necessary on this parallel track and the differences between the two, because option A would only go forth with the, um, the first two calls would only use the STB track. Uh, and then finally, um, there is a requirement to update the, um, the RTP as far as the greenhouse gas rulemaking um, that would allow that to proceed before we open the calls for the 24 to 27 call. Uh, the second option, which again is just one gigantic call for regional and sub-regional coming 22 to 27. Um, this is the quickest overall. Um, it would allow us to do um, those parallel tracks. Um, I, I'm sorry, the new parallel tracks expected that it would take longer um, if done first, um, delaying the allocation of the 22 to 25, though versus option A, that would only delay it a couple months. Um, and then also, again, talking about the RTP updates that are required, um, there is that potential for um, staff overload and policy misalignments if that happens to take place. Um, actually, I think I might pause right here before we sort of go into the Mentimeter and see if there's any comments or questions before sort of taking your feel on that. I know um, there's a lot to unpack. Uh, thank you, Todd. I was going to suggest that. So any uh, questions or comments? I see Deborah has raised her hand. I'll let you go ahead, Deborah. Okay. Whoops. I just realized I moved my camera's cattywampus. Um, so Todd, this is a detailed question, but I think it's an important one. Um, I can't figure out which slide it was, but almost four slides back as part of part four, you were talking about a creative option to leverage the multimodal funds um, by using 50% multimodal, 40% CMAC and other funds. Yeah, down the bottom, the very mm -hmm. last comment. Um, that, I realize that's just part of this whole strategy, but that really catches my eye as a way, looks to me like it reduces the local match to 10%. Am I reading that correctly? It, the match that, that the local government would be providing would be on the federal funds. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay. I just needed that clarification as part of the big picture. Thank you. That's all I have for now. Okay. Other comments before we sort of move on to the polling? Ron? I, I think I think Brian Weimer's still having difficulty with his technology. So I thought I saw he put in a chat message asking what staff's preference is. And I I I won't say we have a formal recommendation yet, Brian, but I think at least from my perspective, I think option A um, is the better balance. Um, it allows us to work through and really, really maximize our opportunity to get the get those federal multimodal options fund um, funds out the door as quickly as possible so that uh, project sponsors have the best opportunity to meet the federal um, obligation and spending deadlines and, and allows the 2050 RTP review um, under Senate Bill 260 to proceed during the course of next year before we do the fuller um, project selection uh, for the 24 to 27 uh, tip cycle. So at least in my thinking, I'd say that's that's my preference, um, but we do want some good discussion and feedback from TAC. Deborah, I see you raised your hand again. Yep, uh, I've been thinking about this in the whole two days that I reviewed the packet. Um, but I, but I, it's so important because of its integration with many other things that are going on. So I wanna speak in favor of option A for a couple of reasons. One is if you've been hanging out in the greenhouse gas conversation, updating the RTP is really paramount to us setting in motion some modified paths forward. So for that reason, I would support option A. But the other reason is I know what the Dr. Cog staff has been through in the past year and, and before that. You're going to lose good people if you make them go through this again. So I just, just like out of the courtesy of my heart, I, I don't think it's a smart thing to have your regional agency staff um, 
exhausted trying to do too many things at once. So that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. Any other comments or concerns or issues? I see a couple have uh, chimed in on, on comments there that they agree with Deborah and appreciated Ron's comments and Deborah's other um, other items? If not, let's go ahead and do the Minty mention. All right, so yeah, the, the, thanks Mr. Chair. So the, the first question we ask is, um, should we use the two allocation processes to leverage the funds and reduce the match? Again, the first process being STPG, the second being the air quality slash multimodal. And I will say we, we've had some initial conversations with, with CDOT and they seem to be okay with this approach. All right. Uh, I will move on to the second question that we have, which is probably the more important here. Um, so what do you feel is the best method to integrate the model, multimodal options fund into uh, both the 22 and the 24 tips and hold the upcoming calls? And I will say, just from a personal perspective, I'm I'm a bit surprised. I mean, I, I'm I'm happy that it's we're leaning in one direction, but I I thought it would be a little bit more uh, even across different options. Mr. Chair, this is Ron. I, I think we we certainly be interested in hearing from folks that are you know and kind of the thought behind um, option B. Definitely want to hear all voices and perspectives. This can't, uh, Todd, I agree with that. All right. Well, that perhaps doesn't make our discussion as long as we thought it may be today. <laughs> So I, I would like to hear on the op from the people that were on option B, if you'd raise your hand and, and we'll like to listen to your concerns or reasoning. Don't be shy guys. This is where we talk these things out. I'm not seeing any hands raised, Todd. So, all right. I guess we'll move on. Nope. Oh, uh, wait, right, Phil. Phil. Yeah, you know, I voted for uh, option A, but I did hear some folks. You know, we kind of had a little chat in the background about what uh, you know, kind of those issues with option A that we were kind of afraid of, and so I'll just sh share those that we're a little concerned about trying to get uh, matching funds together quickly for that for that call. And so that was one of the things that we did, we, we heard kind of ancillary to this, but again, we were, I was for option A, so I can't really speak against it too much, but that is one of the concerns we heard. Thank you, Phil. Any other concerns? That That is a legitimate one. Ryan, it looks like you were ready to speak. Yeah, I just, I just, I, I think that's a, that's a really important point. I think um, because of the way the legislature um, decided to front load the multimodal options fund program with um, the federal um, ARPA funds, the ARPA funds are what's driving the need to get those dollars out the door quickly. And so, uh, but I also understand the 
the pressure that puts on local project sponsors um, on kind of adapting to projects quickly. Um, that's that's part. That's one of the reasons we think sort of putting those dollars together with CMAC funds and um, transportation alternative funds um, to help leverage and, and, and help take some of the pressure off the local map. So just to expand on Todd's answer to Deborah's question, the, the concept there is that a local sponsor would provide 10% local match on the overall project costs um, because the CMAC funds require 20% match. But if you're using multimodal options fund or TA funds to provide half of the project costs that that 20% match on the federal funds represents only a 10% match on the total project cost. So we think that's a real benefit um, and will help hopefully help ease some of that. Um, the other conversation, just to um, tip our hand a little bit that we need to kind of finalize with, C with CDOT, but we've initiated is thinking through sort of when the funds play out. And we, we, think there's, we think there's an opportunity for a solution where, you know, most projects aren't done in a single year. Um, and remember the, the, spending, the spending deadline for those, for those ARPA funds is the end of uh, calendar year 2026. So there is a little bit of lead time. Um, but we've had we've initiated some conversations with CDOT and we need to nail down, but we think that there's a path where the ARPA funds could be spent early and then the, the federal and local match dollars um, for those federal funds to complete the funding package for the project could fund, could come into play later in a project uh, schedule. Um, to help give a little bit of time for the local sponsors on the match issue and for those federal funds to, to catch up to the CMAC or the TA funds to catch up with the ARPA funds. And that's, we can do that because the ARPA funds under federal law um, can be 100% federal. They don't, they don't inherently require a non-federal match. The only reason they require a 50% match is because the legislature put them in the multiple options fund program, which requires a 50% match. So I hope that hope that helps a little bit, Phil. I know it's really complicated. I know we're trying to get our arms around this too, um, and trying to put together a package that that we hope will be kind of give us the best path forward towards um, successfully getting these dollars out the door and, and making some really important improvements to the system. Thank you, Ron. Phil, did that clear up or muddy the water for you? <laughs> no, it did help. I appreciate it because it uh, kind of gets us a little closer to wrapping our heads around this whole idea of how this could work. So hopefully it answered one of my colleagues' questions as well. Okay. I, I like the 10% match, not the 20 from the from the locals also, if I'm understanding wrong right there. So. That's, that's good too. Any other comments or concerns on this? So Mr. Chair, I do, I do have one additional thing while I have everyone sort of sort of attention talking about this uh, has to do with the wait list. Um, so for the, those sponsors that do have projects on the current wait list, um, I would suggest to go back and look at those projects a little bit more in depth. Um, I expect that as soon as we know what our distribution is for the multimodal options fund program, we will start that wait list process. Um, the best case scenario, I believe it would probably happen later in November, perhaps early December, um, but we will start reaching out at that time um, once we are secure with our distribution. Um, knowing that we have funding to allocate. And again, it's going to get a little confusing because we're going to probably have to skip over a lot of those projects that are not going to be eligible um, for that funding type. So um, there will be further information as we go along, uh, but certainly for those sponsors that do have projects, um, at least gather some facts about the current status of those projects and, and whether or not they could go move, move forward if they meet the eligibility under uh, the multimodal options fund program. Thanks for the heads up, Todd. Any additional items from you, Todd? Nope, I think I'm all set. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ron, uh, we'll go ahead and move on to you on the uh, federal infrastructure bill update. Um, and unless they pass something to, er, 
today while we were on tech. I don't know that. Uh, you have a lot to update, but I'll let you go. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I don't believe anything's passed yet. And they're still they're still working. And and again, I think you know the path is the path forward is still um, uncertain, but but still important to sort of start thinking about these issues. Um, and we'll have to see. So just by way of quick background, uh, the Senate did approve. Uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, it's a $1.2 $1 trillion infrastructure package uh, that they passed back in August. Um, it, it includes and wraps into that infrastructure package um, the uh, reauthorization of the FAST Act. Um, and so that's why, that's why when, um, the, when the House did not approve the bill um, late last week. That's why the FAST Act lapsed for a little bit of time. Um, felt really sorry for our friends at Federal Highway Administration who um, ended up getting furloughed for a day because of that lapse in the FAST Act. Um, and I think over the weekend, the Senate, the, the House then um, Friday evening, I think, passed a continuing resolution of the FAST Act. And then the Senate, Senate came on board over the weekend. And so glad, glad to know uh, that at least we're operating under a continuing resolution of the FAST Act. But in the meantime, um, folks are hard at work trying to see if they can reach some compromise that will lead to um, a final approval of this infrastructure investment package. And when we, we've briefed TAC um, on sort of the big picture funding issues for the program and thought it might be worth talking a little bit about some of the policy changes that are included in the in the bill around transportation and I, I certainly um, didn't attempt to capture all policy changes there's there's a lot in there but tried to focus on the ones that most directly affect um, Dr. Cog as the MPO for the Denver region and and therefore affects all of you in some way or another um, so uh, included an attachment in the packet to try to uh, capture those I'm not I'm certainly not going to go through all of them today uh, I grouped them by uh, program area. So the Surface Transportation Block Grant Program, um, I hit a couple of highlights. It did, it retained under the FAST Act, the suballocated portion that's, that's suballocated to areas based on population in the SDBG program had increased to 55%. It had started at, oh, I think uh, 50% uh, at the beginning of the FAST Act, ramped up to 55%. Uh, this bill retains that 55% level and, and keeps it throughout the, throughout the, um, the um, reauthorization period. It does modify the, the population areas um, under which suballocation happens. Uh, so there's a little bit of detail there in terms of the population areas over 200,000, um, urban areas uh, with populations of 50 to 199. 999 popular 199,999 in population um, and so forth. So it does adjust that a bit. Um, it does require some additional consultation with um, the regional transportation planning organizations uh, if they exist for, for urban areas under 50,000 population. So some new requirements there. It expands eligibility uh, for eligible projects under the program. It adds wildlife crossings and an important issue in Colorado. Uh, many of you are aware of that. It also um, adds um, intelligent transportation technologies, cybersecurity threat protection, um, among several other new eligibilities under the funding program. It does require, it does increase the required set aside for off system bridges from 15% under the FAST Act to 20%. And then it gives some additional flexibility for. Um, smaller areas and, and allows up to 15% um, of the money that has to be obligated in the areas under 50,000 population to be obligated on uh, roads that are classified as rural minor collectors or local roads, uh, which is pretty significant, um, or, on pro or on facilities that are critical rural freight corridors. Um, so that's, that's a new flexibility that's, that's pretty interesting uh, for kind of the, the smaller um, areas. It also, um, at the request of um, MPOs, um, there, there can be um, an additional um, amount up to 15% of SDBG apportionment uh, to be used on project types. Again, maintenance activities and roads functionally classified as rural minor collectors or local roads. 
Um, so some, some additional flexibility. Um, there's the set aside program under STBG, which is the transportation alternatives program or TAP. Uh, that funding, that funding set aside goes up fairly significantly. So it's not, it, it would be set at 10% of STBG funds, which is a pretty, pretty good increase uh, and bump over uh, current law under the FAST Act. Um, it also um, increases the sub allocation to areas based on population from 50% to 59% of the set aside funds. Uh, it does allow states to allocate the full 100% of the funding to counties, MPOs, regional planning organizations, or local governments. Um, safe routes to school projects would be eligible under the Transportation Alternatives Program, um, and then some, some other uh, changes um, to that program. Uh, moving on to um, the National Highway Freight Program, it, um, there were limits under the FAST Act in terms of the number of miles that could be designated for rural freight corridors and um, urban freight corridors. So it increases the number of miles that can be designated. That's pretty important. Um, when, that, when that came into the FAST Act, we, those limitations really made it challenging to really uh, designate those, those freight corridors. Um, on the system, those those miles were were a pretty pretty significant limiting factor. So, we're going from 75 miles under current law for critical urban freight corridors up to 150 miles. So that will that will help uh, designate the most important um, of those urban uh, critical freight corridors. Um, it also uh, it also increases the amount of the National Highway Freight Program funds that a state can obligate for freight intermodal or freight rail projects to, to 30%. So triples the amount that can be obligated for those types of projects. On the CMAC program, congestion mitigation and air quality, um, it adds some additional new eligibilities. I'll highlight the shared micromobility projects is, is a pretty interesting new addition in the um, eligible uses for CMAC funds. And then um, it does it does allow CMAC funds to be used for operating assistance for public transportation projects, which is great. The problem is um, that 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 is not allowed for um, urbanized areas with a population of greater than 20, 200,000 population. So Dr. Cog would unfortunately in our region would not be able to take advantage of this new flexibility. Um, maybe maybe next time we'll we'll get there, but um, we continue to be limited in our ability to use uh, CMAC funds to to provide um, public transportation um, operating assistance for projects. Moving on, Ron, to, I have a quick question yeah, on that, real quick. For um, sure, Alex. Yeah. does is that different for the Boulder Longmont and Louisville Lafayette Erie UZAs since we're not the same as the Denver Aurora UZA? <laughs> it's a good question, Alex, and I, I don't I don't have a I don't have a hundred percent answer for you, but I believe that it's limiting as well. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Yep. Um, Safe for us to school gets codified um, in 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 the bill. Um, uh, it expands uh, safe routes to school projects to high schools uh, to be eligible for for funding, which is a, a nice extension. Um, and then um, the the state states will receive funding um, in in a ratio of uh, based on student enrollment, um, but no state will receive less than a million dollars in any given fiscal year during the during the course of the law. Um, on let's say I'm gonna. On public transportation, it, it uh, states clearly that uh, SDBG or metropolitan planning funds can be used to carry out a capital project for the construction of a bus rapid transit project or a dedicated bus lane. Uh, so that will be helpful. And it, certainly in the context of our 2050 regional transportation plan and our, uh, our, our desire to expand the bus rapid transit system in the region over time, that'll be, that'll be a helpful flexibility. Um, on transportation planning, um, several new sort of clarifying uh, points, but um, a couple that I'll highlight are that um, it does, it, it, would it will require MPOs to consult with um, housing officials um, and add housing as uh, to the scope of the planning processes. So bringing, bringing consideration of housing into um, our planning discussions. Um, and it does, um, uh, it does um, allow um, TMAs, transportation management areas like Dr. Cog, to add a housing coordination process 
uh, to address integrating housing, transportation, economic development strategies um, in our transportation planning process. Um, obviously, I think I think we all are pretty acutely aware of sort of the housing challenges um, in this region and and kind of the relationship between our housing decisions and and transportation and so forth. Um, let's see. I will move all the way down to the safe and accessible transportation options towards the end, uh, page four. Uh, so there is a new requirement in the in the bill that re would require um, MPOs to use at least two and a half percent of our uh, metropolitan planning funds to, um, uh, to carry out activities that increase safe and accessible options for multi multiple travel modes. Um, the, those activities are mainly sort of complete street standards and policies and prioritized complete streets projects. So I'm, I'm happy that we have um, initiated that work, grateful for grateful for Jacob and his team um, and the region for really um, embracing the complete streets issue at a regional level. I think it puts us ahead of the curve here uh, if this, if this um, bill becomes law and we have that requirement, I think we'll be ahead of the curve and can start moving into implementing um, those types of projects. And then the last one I'll highlight on the last page is the new carbon reduction program. Um, so this is a new formula program that's included in the bill. Um, it, um, it includes significant eligible projects targeted mainly at carbon reduction um, and air quality. Um, but I've listed uh, the eligibility projects there um, in this paper. I'll note that CMAC, CMAC eligible program uh, project, projects that are eligible for CMAC funding are also eligible for the carbon reduction program, plus other, plus other types of projects. And there are infrastructure-based um, intelligent transportation system, capital improvements, vehicle to infrastructure communication, energy efficient street lighting and traffic control devices among others. So there's additional new eligibilities that could be used for under this program. Mm -hmm. um, speaking, uh, let's see, states have to develop a carbon reduction strategy in consultation with MPOs within the state um, under the program. Um, and then formula funds are suballocated to areas based on populations similar to SDBG funds, except for 65% of these funds are suballocated uh, compared to the 55% of the SDBG funds that are suballocated under this SDBG program. Um, and then uh, before obligating funds in an urban urbanized area that, that is not a TMA, so the um, uh, the other MPOs besides us uh, and um, North Front Range, so the other three MPOs, and then other areas around the state, uh, there's a consultation um, uh, requirement. Um, and, and then um, uh, the state has to consult with those regional transportation areas for the for outside MPOs. Um, I'll wrap up here pretty quickly. The, there was a change in the state freight advisory committee. So states are required under the FAST Act to, to form state freight advisory committees. So Colorado has a freight advisory committee in place. This adds required representation on the freight advisory committees, uh, adds MPOs, uh, state environmental protection department, state air resource boards, if they exist, economic development agencies, and uh, nonprofit organizations or community organizations um, to the required membership list of those freight advisory committees. So it would mandate a voice for, for uh, Dr. Cog on the state's uh, freight advisory committee or other MPOs, I suppose. Not all MPOs have to be um, represented, but at least MPOs have to be represented. And then um, finally, the last one I'll mention is that under the fixed guideway capital investment grants, the, the SIG program, it increases, the bill increases the small start uh, federal assistance from 100 to $150 million from $100 million. So that is potentially helpful for future BRT corridors around the region that might be really competitive for small starts grants. So it increases the federal share. Um, and it also increases for um, other, uh, the maximum capital cost of the project, of the of the overall project from 300 million to $400 million. So you can do bigger projects and you can get a higher, a, a bigger uh, federal share um, under, the, under the revised capital investment 
uh, grant program under the bill. I'll wrap up there, Mr. Chair, just to leave time for any questions or discussion but before we need to wrap up and get over to the special board meeting at four. Okay, um, Brian Weimer had a question in the um, um, in the chat. Uh, it says, has Dr. Cog's staff started to consider if policy on use of the uh, funds as allowed in the legislation versus a Dr. Cog possibly a previous legislation would allow maintenance for maintenance, but Dr. Cog policy uh, has limited use for reconstruction only. Also, have you heard anything about inclusion of house earmark processes or slash projects that was included in the house version of, uh, into this Senate bill? Okay, so thanks. Thanks for the questions, Brian. Um, on the first one, we haven't we haven't really we haven't had that conversation internally yet um, to think about that. Um, uh, so uh, appreciate the prod, and we'll we'll give some we'll give some thought to that. Um, uh, the issue of um, reconstruction versus maintenance. There are still some pretty significant limitations on maintenance, but um, we'll 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 talk about that internally. Um, and then on the um, on the earmarks, um, let's see the in the infrastructure bill as it is, uh, there are there are no there are no authorization earmarks. Um, and I, I think that most folks believe that um, the infrastructure bill is going to have to pass the House as it was adopted out of the Senate, that there's 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 kind of no room for negotiation on the infrastructure bill as it came out of the Senate. It, that's it's going to get passed by the House or it's not. Um, however, the uh, the larger budget reconciliation discussions that are going on and and quite frankly, which has held up the the house's consideration of the infrastructure bill um i believe that um house um uh, environmental uh, environment and public works committee chair um congressman defazio did in did include a pot of money for congressionally directed spending uh, for projects and i believe that sort of the amount was equivalent to sort of the house earmark list of projects uh, that that they had been considering. So we kind of just have to wait and see how that how that plays out and how negotiations go over the reconcil around the um, budget reconciliation bill. Thank you, Ron. Um, are there any additional uh, questions for Ron or comments on this? Please raise your hand. I do not see any additional runs, so thank you. And uh, I imagine you'll be giving us an update uh, in one of our future meetings on this in more detail. With that, um, let's move on to some of our administrative items. And uh, Carson Priest, if you have an update on the AMP working group, I'd appreciate it. I do, Mr. Chair, thank you. The AMP working group has met actually twice since we last had a TAC meeting due to our rescheduling. In September, we heard from the city of Aspen about their smart zone curbside management pilot program uh, for curbside management there in the city. We also heard an informational briefing that month from Colorado Car Share talking about the future of that industry in our state. During that meeting, we discussed Dr. Cog's work plan for the upcoming UPWP in the 2022-2023 cycle. At the October meeting, which was yesterday, we heard from CDOT's Division of Aeronautics and the CSU Drone Center, as they both spoke about the future of unmanned aerial systems in Colorado. CDOT gave an update about their electrification charging station plan that's going on across the state. And E-470 was there to update the group about their recent mobility and innovative pilot programs that they've been conducting along the parkway over the last year or so. Uh, that's all. I'd be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carson. Uh, if you have any questions for um, Carson, please uh, raise your hand. I see no questions, Carson, so you're off the hook today. Uh, thank you for the report and update. Um, our next meeting is October 25th, um, 2021, and hope to uh, have all of you on our virtual meeting then. 
And with that, we are adjourned at 3.29 p.m. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Thank you, Kat. Thank you.